All right. You know, before we get to the resurrection, we have to deal with this. And it's unpleasant. I mean, we really don't like to deal with this. We don't even like to think about it, do we? I mean, it wasn't that long ago when COVID-19 came that our fear of this caused us to constrain ourselves voluntarily, didn't we? Right? I mean, we separated ourselves. We kept ourselves at home. We didn't go to work. We didn't go to school. We didn't send the kids to school. We didn't go to church. We put on masks. We stayed six feet away from one another because we were afraid that this might happen either to us or to somebody that we love. It's just unpleasant. But this box is not the only thing in life that constrains us, does it? That keeps us, you might say, from living our destiny or our potential. I mean, sometimes it's our emotions that constrain us, or it's our finances that constrain us, or maybe it's a relationship that constrains us. There are a lot of different things that keep us from experiencing our destiny, our purpose, all that God created us to be, and the price that he paid when he came, even the resurrection itself. Now, I didn't want to just give you words. I thought it would be interesting to, to show you the process of being constrained and then actually being set free. And so we asked an illusionist, a magician, a uh, escape artist, you might say, to come and demonstrate for us. He's performed before uh, Michael Jordan and Shaquille O'Neal and even Madonna, an interesting group of people. So if you would, join with me and let's welcome the amazing Adam. Can you do that? All right. Yeah, here he is. Is this the mic on? Perfect. Potential Church, how are we doing? All right. You having a good time? I'm going to put a stop to that right now. By show of hands, how many of you out there have ever seen professional magic live? Well, you're not going to be seeing any this afternoon, so lower those expectations. I don't need the pressure. I'm kidding. I'm kind of a big deal. I was voted number one magician in my apartment complex. Thank you. 14 units. So what are we doing? Oh, an escape. All right. Thank you for having me. Yes. Thank you for having great taste in entertainment. Thanks for helping out, Josh. Josh, Troy, applause, please. Thank you. Hey, hey, save some for me. These are master locks. I got these at Home Depot. I'm not sure they know it yet, but that's where I got them from. Uh, please examine those. And I have some shackles. Shackles. And I would like you, Troy, to thoroughly examine those. Right. That's enough. Okay, how's those locks doing? All right, examine these. Okay. <laughs> Troy is going to lock me up, and you're going to hand them the locks. Good? Checks yes, out sir. okay? Checks out All right, okay. Perfect. Hand him one of the locks, please, Josh. Lock me up nice and tight. Mm -hmm. No slack, please. Don't be a slacker. This is the hard part. <laughs> Y'all are too quiet. No pressure, no pressure. They're making Push me nervous. They're too yes, quiet. all right. Now the next one goes behind the back. You, if you hold up this. Don't sleeve. worry, I haven't cheated yet. It's coming up. <laughs> nice and tight, please, boys. There we go, some music. There all we right, go. a little round of applause for these guys one more time. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I am going to attempt, and I verbally underline the word attempt, to escape from these shackles. As a bonus, I'll try to escape from my suit jacket as well. How cool is that? Can I get an amen? amen. Can I get an amen? amen? All right, what's it to you? Hallelujah. All right, boys, we're gonna get into the curtain. Let's give this a go. Gentlemen, raise the curtain up. Raise it all the way up. All right, I'd like to give you an update can you lower the curtain for me, please? I am halfway there, making record progress. Shall we continue? <laughs> Gentlemen, raise the curtain up. Now, the greatest escape artist of all time is Harry Houdini. And he, would, uh, he was actually double jointed, so he could get out of these things a lot easier. I will not be dislocating my shoulder for you this afternoon. However, uh, hold on. 
lower the curtain, guys. I'm sorry to disappoint this audience on Easter. <sighs> Josh. Troy. Can I be honest with you guys, since we're all friends? That wasn't a rhetorical question. I need the feedback. Can I be honest with you guys, since we're all friends? I'm not even a magician. I just learned this crazy stuff so that I could talk to you all about a wonderful investment opportunity known as Amway. <laughs> Lock the doors, Troy. We got them right where we want them. Yes. No, I really want to get out, but uh, I don't know. I just don't feel like I can go on. I mean, not without some encouragement from this audience, even in the cheap seats. Oh, wow. You guys are giving me the energy needed for this finish. Boys, raise the curtain up. Raise it all the way up. This is going to take a little bit, so please feel free to talk amongst yourselves. It's hard to do with the microphone dragging on the ground. Okay, I think under the circumstances, it's the best I can get it on Easter for you guys. Drop the curtain completely for me, boys. Josh, take this off of me, please. Oh. How you doing? I would have gotten out sooner if you didn't lock me up so tight. But I want to thank you for helping out. Yes. I want to thank you for helping out. I want to thank you all for coming out today. Happy Easter, Amazing Adam. Thank you very, very much. Pleasure to perform the for Amazing you guys. Adam, everybody. Thank you, very much. thank you so much for being here. And, you know, it's a beautiful thing when we're set free from that which constrains us. You know, sometimes we try to do it ourselves, kind of like, the amazing Adam did, and we get the jacket in the wrong place. It doesn't quite get there, but this is Easter, and we're here to celebrate the resurrection, the idea that we can be unconstrained. You know, I, I was thinking, because we, you, you love to see it in somebody's life, when they're set free from anxiety or depression or uh, the sense of being weighed down. A, a couple of years ago, I, I saw my dad for the last time. He had been struggling with cancer. He had it on his tongue and his jaw. And so they had to take out part of his tongue over a few years. And so he couldn't really communicate. And he was at the end of his life. And I flew to Arkansas. And I was there in the hospital room. And as I was getting ready to leave, I didn't realize it would be the last time that I saw him. But my dad was a big baseball guy because he got drafted by what at the time was the Kansas City A's. And uh, as I was getting ready to walk out, I thought, you know what, I need to show him. I had a, a video of Lion, his great-grandson, who had um, just started. He was three. Lion was three at the time. He just started playing baseball. And so I went back over, and I showed my dad this video right here. And uh, let me watch it. Keep your eye on that ball. So when I showed, I showed him that video, and for just a few moments, my dad broke free of those constraints that were robbing him of his ability to communicate, robbing him of his joy. And he looked at that video, and he looked up at me, and he smiled, and then he gave me a thumbs up. And out of all the time, those last um, few hours that I spent with my dad, that's the only time I saw him smile, and it's the only time I saw any kind of... Uh, effort to communicate or to, to break free. It's a beautiful thing when it happens in our lives. And that's why we celebrate Easter, because it's on that first Easter in which Jesus resurrected from that, those constraints of death. You, you remember the story, right? The ladies go to the tomb, they're going to do some stuff, and when they get there, of course, the stones rolled away, and Jesus is not there. And the angel's like, what are you doing? <laughs> Why are you looking for the living among the dead? He's not here. He is alive. And they rush back to the apostles who are constrained, the Bible tells us, behind locked doors. And they walk in and they're like, guys, you're not going to believe this. Can you imagine? Jesus is alive. But of course, the apostles couldn't imagine it. That's exactly what the scripture tells us in Luke chapter 24 and verse 11. It says, but the story 
that these ladies were sharing sounded like nonsense. So they didn't believe it. They just couldn't imagine it. That is, except for the one who wrote this. Luke, the physician. We know that he, maybe he was reminded of some things that Jesus said. Whatever it was, he could imagine the possibility that just maybe, maybe they were telling the life, uh, telling uh, the truth. And the reason we know that is because he acted. He left. He got up and he went to the tomb because he could imagine the possibility that Jesus was alive. So I went to, to Webster and the definition for the word imagination is this. It's in the outline. If you want to follow along, it's on the app. But here's what Mr. Webster says. It's the act of or power of forming a mental image of something not present. So our imagination is the ability to see something in our mind that is not yet reality in our presence. And I thought, you know what? That sounds a lot like how the Bible describes faith. In Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1, it says it like this. It says, faith is the confidence that what we hope for will actually happen. It is the imagination, right? The belief that what we hope for will actually happen. It gives us the assurance about the things we can't see. Our imagination is something that God has given us. Our ability to see something, to believe something that the scripture tells us that the spirit speaks to us and then act upon it. Our imaginations are so powerful that God himself talked about them in the book of Genesis. When the people were building what will be referred to as the Tower of Babel, they were rejecting God, they were empowering themselves. Listen to what God says about the imagination. In Genesis eleven six. 6, it says, God speaking says, nothing they, humanity, have imagined they can do will be impossible for them. Words, anything that can come within their imagination Anything that they act upon, they'll be able to accomplish. Paul said in 2 Corinthians that we walk, which is an action, not by what we see, but by what we believe, by our faith, by our imagination, by our confidence in what God has said, even though it is yet to actually happen. So how do we resurrect our imagination? Because so many of us, even this Easter, are probably... I want to raise this up, are probably constrained in some way, feel bound when it comes to accomplishing our purpose or our destiny. For example, I was thinking this week that maybe some of us are constrained by discouragement, just kind of down. Things haven't gone the way that you hoped that they would go. I, I, I know, you know, for me, as a pastor, I get the opportunity each week to come out here and to speak God's word. And I always feel the weight of that. I want to make sure that I don't mess it up. You know, I, I want to speak the truth. And sometimes, though, when I come out, you know, we have service on Saturday at 5, and then we have two live services on Sunday at 10 and 12. And sometimes when I come out, and it just doesn't go right. You know, sometimes you, you guys just act like you're dead. I mean, you, you ought to see you from the way I see you. You know, some of you, you, you haven't smiled in the 24 years I've been here. Some of you come and you sit like this. I dare you to say something I agree with. And, and, and sometimes, and it's discouraging. And I, like, man, did I, what did I do? How can I, because I want to make a difference. I want to be effective. And on those weekends, I'll go home and Steph will be like, ah, oh, what do you want for dinner or something? I'll be like, I don't care, whatever you want. You know, even my grandkids who can normally get me to do anything will come out and say, Ta, that's what they call me, Ta. They were supposed to call me King, but instead they call me Ta. <laughs> I say, Ta, you want to play? Will you play with me? And I'll be like, ah, oh, maybe later. I, I, I wrote down the way I feel, and, and maybe you do the same, is the reason I get discouraged is because all I can see is more of the same. I don't believe it's ever going to change. So it's like, what, what does it matter? Why act? Why move? Why progress if it's not going to change? Right? I've done it so many times. I've done this. I've done that. Right? And we get discouraged. This relationship is never going to change. Why try? Maybe some of you feel that way today. 
I mean, it took everything you've got to even be here. Because you're like, what's the matter? I've been to church before. It hasn't made any difference. But what if you were to imagine to have faith, to believe in a God that actually keeps his promises? That does what he says he's going to do. Because that's what the scripture tells us. In Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 23, it says this. It says, let us hold tightly without wavering to what? To the hope. What is the hope? It is the promise, right? We're hanging on. The enemy wants to rob God's promises from our lives. All the things that God says about your purpose and your destiny and your future. The enemy wants to rob that. The scripture says, hang on tightly to those. And we can hang on tightly to our hope. Why? Because God can be trusted to keep his promises. That what he has said in his word he will do, he will do. Can you imagine that? Can you have faith in that? Can you believe in that? Sometimes we are constrained by discouragement. Sometimes we're constrained by fear. Fear has a way. You ever been so afraid you couldn't move? I have an uncle that when we were little, every Halloween, he would find a new mask and he would hide somewhere at our house and jump out and scare us. And it was like, a, like one of those really expensive, scary masks. And I remember one year, we get, we'd pull up into the driveway, we'd get out of the car, and when I get out, he jumps out, and I'm so scared, I threw my mom's purse at him and just froze, right? Because I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't move. I thought that was a good idea, so I decided to get a monkey costume and go scare one of my friends. I put on this full gorilla costume, and they were twins. And one had one room on this room, and uh, one had a room uh, on that room, bedroom, two bedrooms. So I go, and I'm like, I'm not going to, I'm going to get them both at the same time. And so I knocked on both doors at the same time. The one on the right opened the door, screamed, and went back in. The one on the left opened the door and punched me in the stomach. <laughs> I decided I wasn't going to do that anymore. Fear can cause us to do some incredibly crazy things so that we don't act. Afraid of what's going to happen to our health or happen to our relationships or fear that we're going to lose our job, right? And you're here and it's good that you're here, but if you're honest, you're, you're afraid. And because you're afraid, you're not acting upon the dream that God's put inside of your heart. You're not even acting maybe upon God's word. But what if... We were to imagine, to believe, to have faith, and that we don't have to be afraid. Why? Because God has a plan. See, it's in our times of fear that the enemy tries to convince us that it's just chaos. Everything is out of control. God doesn't even know what's going on. But imagine that while to you and I in this moment, it may seem crazy. Can you imagine a God who has a plan? Two years ago during Christmas time, we were working. Christmas is always a big time of ministry. And so Steph was sitting right over here and she got a text late one night when we were working on some stuff. It was from our landlord. And our landlord said that he is going through a divorce and he was going to have to sell the house, which meant we were going to have to move within the month. And it's like at Christmas time, it's not a good time to move. And not only that, if you remember two years ago, there just weren't very many homes to rent anywhere. And so we were frightened. What are we going to do? You know, we went to one house, but it's like, how far away are we going to have to move just to find a house in which to stay? But the reality is, is that we did find a house. And the reason we found a house is because God has a plan. And the landlords that we presently have are the nice, kindest landlords that Steph and I have ever had in all the years that we have lived here. And I believe that because God has a plan, that these landlords that we have in the not too near future are actually going to experience the love of Christ for themselves. Imagine that even today and whatever it is that's going on in your life, and I don't want to downplay what it is. There's some scary things in this world. Maybe the doctor gave you some scary news, but what if, can you imagine, can you have faith in the fact that the scripture tells us that God does have a plan? Romans 8, 28 says, and we know that God causes everything to work together for good for those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. In other words, in this fallen world, 
which is full of brokenness and hurt and pain. It's not the world that God created. And yet God still promises and he keeps his promises that he has a plan. And that he's going to reconcile what's going on in our world for good. Sometimes we feel constrained or we feel bound because we're discouraged. Sometimes it's because we're afraid. And sometimes it's just because, well, it's because of scarcity. We just don't have enough. You ever feel like that? There's so much you want to do, but you just don't have the money to do it. You just don't have the time to do it. You just don't have the resources to do it. Maybe even you took a step of faith. You started that business, but now it seems like you got less than you did before. Or maybe you told God, you know what, I'm going to start living generously. And you started being a giver of your tithes and your offerings and helping and all kinds of different. And yet you're like, God, it's not working out the way that I thought that it would. How am I going to move forward if I don't have enough? When uh, Steph and I moved here, we... In Arkansas, I don't know if you know this or not, we lived in rural Arkansas. There's a big difference between Arkansas and South Florida. It costs a lot more money to live here. It's just different. And so in Arkansas, we had a house that we had bought and everything. When we got here, we didn't have enough money to buy a house. So we lived in a mobile home, which was a lot smaller. And Steph had to go find a, another job. And the kids had to go to daycare, right? All of these things. And so since we don't have enough, <laughs> the easiest thing to do would just be to retreat. Right? Just to go back, to, to go home. And again, you get to that place where you're just like, I don't know what to do. I, I, and it's so easy in those moments to whether it is to retreat or just to give up. But what if we were to imagine a God who gives abundantly? What if you were to put your faith not in what you see in your present, but walking in your imagination, walking in your faith, walking in what God's word says. Because look at what Jesus himself said. In Matthew chapter 6, he says, don't worry about these things. Saying, what are we going to eat? What are we going to drink? What are we going to wear? Those are, all, those are all the things we worry about, right? I don't have enough. Where am I going to live? What am I going to drive? How am I going to send the kids to college? How am I going to go to college? How are we ever going to get married? How are we going to pay for this kid? What about our doctor bills? And here's Jesus saying, don't worry about those things. He says, those things dominate the thoughts of people who are not Christ followers, who are unbelievers. But your heavenly father, he already knows what, what Troy needs. He already knows what you need. He says, instead of worrying about those things, instead of being bound by those things and thinking, well, I just can't do anything because I don't have enough. He says what? He says, seek the kingdom of God above all else, live righteously, and he... God will give you everything you need. You know, on Friday, after our Good Friday service, I was backstage with our two grandkids. Tyler is five, and, or excuse me, Lion is five, and Luna is two. And Luna had one of those little packages of gummies. You know what I'm talking about? And Lion was trying to get them. And Luna was scared to death that she was going to lose her gummy. So she's hanging on to him tight. Now, while all that's going on, I'm trying to get Luna's attention. Because I want her to come over and see her top. You know, she's at that age where she just smiles and melts your heart. And I want her to look into my eyes and say, love you, top. You're awesome. I love you better than goo goo, which is what they call Stephanie. All right. But she's just ignoring me. Focused on her brother and his, her fear that he was going to get her gummies. You know what she didn't realize? I know where the gummies are. I can get her more gummies. And not only that, if the gummies were gone, I have enough money that I could go buy her tons of gummies. More than she could ever eat. But she wasn't, she wasn't focused on me. She ignored me because she was worried she didn't have enough to give her brother. See, her problem wasn't scarcity. Her problem was focus and priority. And I think Jesus is saying, that's our problem too. I mean, he owns all the cattle on all the hills. See, it's not a scarcity problem. It's a focus problem. Listen to again what Jesus says in John 10, 10. He says, I, Jesus, came so that you can have real and eternal life, more and better life than you ever dreamed. Sometimes we allow ourselves to be constrained by fear or discouragement or scarcity. When if we would just imagine a God who keeps his promise, a God who gives and provides abundantly, sometimes 
We're constrained I don't, I, I, by the weight of our responsibility. You ever feel like that? Like you just got so much to do, it overwhelms you. I mean, you got so many places to be. I mean, you got your boyfriend you got to take care of, and you got your dog you got to take care of, and you got your house, and you got your car, and you got your spouse, and you got your job, and right, you got all of this stuff, and it's just way t- taxes are due in what, 15 days? Some of you are like, oh my gosh, right? All of the, all, and then we have all the technology is supposed to make life simpler. But that's not the way it works. I'm old enough, many of you are not old enough. I'm old enough to remember when we used to write letters to people. And when you would write a letter to part somebody, you would expect them to respond in a month. Today, you get a text and somebody is like, uh, um, you know, did you get my text? And you're like, well, when did you send it? Well, 15 minutes ago. You haven't responded, is something wrong? And then we lie, don't we? We're like, I didn't get it, this stupid phone. Right? We just pretend like we didn't get it because we feel guilty. And that thing's been in my phone for 15 minutes and I haven't responded. So I can tell you when my phone dings with a new text, I just start getting nervous. And then it'll ding with an email and then I start sweating. And then it's a direct message buzz, right? And I am completely stressed out because I know all these people are expecting me to respond to them immediately, even if I don't know the answer to their question. (sighs) It's overwhelming. And when we get overwhelmed, what do we do? We stop acting. We are constrained by just this sense of I don't know where to start because I got so much to do. But what if you and I were to imagine a God who supplies partners, who supplies people to do life with, people who you can care for and will care for you, people you can love and be loved by, people you can encourage and they will encourage you. Because that's exactly what the scripture says. Look with me in Hebrews chapter 10. He says, we, who's he he talking about? He's talking about Christ followers. He's talking about you and me. We should keep on doing what? Encouraging, partnering with each other to be thoughtful and to do helpful things. To be the solution to each other's problems. He goes on in verse 25. And he says, some people have given up the habit of meeting for worship coming to church you know I shared with you earlier that because of our fear of that that we quit going to work and quit going to school and many quit going to church around the world the number is somewhere between I don't know 40 and 60 percent of those who went to church before COVID are actually worshiping after COVID now that's pretty incredible so many people have become distracted It means there's a lot of more darkness in this world because Jesus says we're the light, but there's like 40 to 60% of that light that's no longer there. But even beyond that, we're missing out on what God says is the opportunity to partner with each other. Look Look at what he says. He says, some people have given up the habit of meeting for worship, but we must not do that. We should keep on what? Encouraging each other. In other words, look around. I mean, look around. Do you realize that the thing you've been praying for, stressed out about, and overwhelmed about, the answer might be right across the aisle? All three of my kids grew up in this church. And all three of my kids met their partners, met their spouses right here. Steph showed you pictures of them. Tyler and Amber, they grew up in the church. They met one another. And this year, they're going to celebrate, I think, their 10th year of marriage. Yeah, that's awesome, right? Carson and Jessica, they met right here. They got married on January the 31st, 2019. So they're going to celebrate their fourth year. Bailey met her husband right here, and we're hoping for a good two months right now, okay? (laughs) But it all, right, it happened right here. People all the time say, well, there are no people to help with this. There's no good guys. There's no good ladies. No, no. I just tell you, you're going to the wrong places, and God will provide. Can you imagine if he would provide you until death do us part partner? Somebody to do life with, somebody to have children with, 
somebody to pursue a dream with, somebody you can count on, somebody's not going to walk away from you? What about a business partner? What about just somebody that's been where you're at, that knows how to deal with what you're dealing with, and they're right here? But maybe you're not. Or maybe you don't engage. And so you've been sitting next to them or in front of them for months or years. And you're so close to the solution to the problem that you have. Can you imagine that? Can you believe in a God that keeps his promises that are found in his word? Lastly, sometimes we get constrained. Unable to pursue our destiny because of discouragement or scarcity or fear. Oh, it's just the weight that we all carry in 2024. And sometimes we are bound or constrained by our fear or by the presence of death. And when I say that, I'm not just talking about physical death. Sometimes it's the death of a relationship, the death of a dream, or the death of a business. Say, so, I mean... <laughs> it's over. Why try? Nothing I can do. He walked away. She gave up. They had an affair. The business went bust. COVID ruined us. The doctor says I've only got a small amount of time to live. But what if <laughs> you could imagine a God who is prepared for life and death. Because that's exactly what the scripture says. Jesus himself says that in John chapter 14. He says, don't let your hearts be troubled. You trust in God, trust also in me. There's more than enough room in my father's home. If that weren't so, I'd have told you. I'm going to do what? To prepare. To prepare a place for you. And when everything is ready, I'm going to come back and get you so that you can go and be with me. Just trust me on this. I have prepared not only for your eternity. In John 10, he said, I have come that you might have life here on planet Earth. Can you imagine? Or like some of the apostles, does it sound like nonsense? Just imagine the opportunity to live life unconstrained, resurrected, set free from being bound by discouragement, by being controlled by fear, by being anxious about scarcity. That, that's why Paul, after the resurrection, now remember, Paul's this guy that wrote so much of the New Testament. We're here today because he started so many churches, and he looks at death, which everyone is afraid of. It's why that box freaks us out. And look at what he says in 1 Corinthians 15. He says, oh, death, where is your victory? Where is your sting? Easter has come and death has been defeated. It no longer has the capacity to bind us or to constrain us. <laughs> Hebrews. Hebrews says the same thing. In Hebrews chapter 2, it says Jesus came and he put on skin. And why did he put on skin? Because that's the only way he could die. He tells us right there in chapter 2, verse 14. He's made of flesh and the Son, also became flesh and blood because the only way he could die was becoming human. They nailed his hands and his feet, a crown of thorns on his head, a spear in his side, and he died. Verse 15 says, because it's the only way he could set free all who have lived their lives as slaves to the fear of that box to the fear of an end of a relationship or the fear that their business was going to close its doors or their fear that they were going to fail or that they weren't going to have enough. That's why he came. Jesus one day got word that his best friend, Lazarus, was sick. And by the time he got to his place to see him, Lazarus had died. He had two sisters, Mary and Martha, and they were ticked at Jesus. I'm like, well, if you'd have been here, you could have saved him. What are you doing showing up? He's been dead for three days. What's the deal? And Jesus looks at Martha, and I want you to see what he says. Jesus told her, I am the resurrection and the life. In other words, what is he saying? He's saying that what you think is dead is not dead. 
Look, that's what he says. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. Everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never die. And then he looks at Martha and he says, do you believe it? See, that's why we celebrate Easter. Because Easter is the celebration of the resurrection. It's the fact that the grave is opened up and that which you thought was dead is alive again. That's what he does. He resurrected relationships and businesses and eternities. And here's the question. It's the same one he asked Martha. Can you imagine that? Can you believe that? The word believe is a Greek word. It means pistuo. It means to sit down in or to rest in. It doesn't mean just to say, yeah, I believe. It means to surrender to, to rely upon, to act. Luke's imagination caused him to act, to move. Faith is the confidence that what we hope for will actually happen. Do you believe? So well, how do I believe? Well, the scripture says, whosoever calls on the name of the Lord will be rescued, saved, salvaged, transformed. We have to be willing to admit, like our magician. That when we try to do it ourselves, sometimes we get our coat over our face. It just doesn't work out. But if we will trust Him, we can live resurrected lives unconstrained by those things the enemy wants to use to keep us down. But whether you're up there in the balcony, here on the floor, on the other side of that camera, you're the only one that can make that decision. And so I'm going to ask you to bow your head and to close your eyes. And you can make that decision, whether you be sitting in another part of the world online, whether you be as high as you can get up there in the balcony or right here on the front row. Will you humble yourself and trust Him? There are no magical words, just a surrendered heart. And I want to lead you in that simple prayer. It's just something like this. God, forgive me for trying to do this my own way. I'm still constrained. I'm still bound up. And I want to be set free. And so I trust you. I surrender to you. And the Bible says that whosoever surrenders, whosoever calls upon him will have transformation, will have not only eternal life, but resurrected life. Life and life abundantly, Jesus said himself. So if you prayed that prayer with a surrendered and believing heart, then God does what we ask him to do. So just tell him thank you. Thank you. Easter. <laughs> it's not about religion. It's about Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for allowing us to live unconstrained lives so that we can pursue you with an abandonment. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.